Hi, Chloe. Thank you. All right, so the dog says he did the math and we can't afford the cat. So I guess the cat's done. <laughs> All right, something brand new today. So we're going to start talking about quadratic functions. Now we've done some stuff with quadratics already, right? We've done all that factoring and whatnot. You know, we've done a lot of that, and you're probably wondering, why are we doing this stuff? Well, <laughs> here's part of the reason coming up, okay? So this is just kind of a, an intro thing today, and then we'll get a little more into it. But we just want to talk about some of the, the features that you'll see in a quadratic function. All right, so one thing we know, or you probably know already, is that if you do a graph of a quadratic function, it, it looks like a letter. It looks like a U shape. OK. So that's typically what we're going to find. And it either goes up or down depending on the number in front of the X squared term. But we're going to get into all that stuff here uh, right about now. So let's go ahead and check it out. All right, it says how does the value of A in each function affect whether the graph affect yeah try it again affect its graph when compared to the graph of a quadratic parent function so the quadratic parent function is y equals x squared okay so probably a good time to break out the desmos we can do a little work with that now i'll bring him in and out as we need it so one moment We'll go ahead and set up an x squared graph here for you. OK, got it. All right, so again, the parent graph is y equals x squared. So Desmos knows that it's going to be y equals something, so it's just x squared. So there's your u shape, OK? Now, the reason for the u shape is we are squaring the number. Anytime you square a number, you're going to get a positive answer. OK. So for example, in this case, we start at 0, 0, right? You can see it right there. OK. So that means, remember, when you have an ordered pair, the first one is your x value, the second one is your y value, right? So this is saying x equals 0 when y equals 0. So what we do is we come back over here and we say, all right, well, if I plug in 0 for x, 0 squared is 0 times 0. That's still 0. So y equals 0. So that's this guy here. OK. Then what if we plug in 1? So if we do 1 times 1, that's just 1, right? So here's 1 and here's 1. So there's that point. Then if we plug in negative 1, negative 1 times negative 1, the two negatives become positive. This is why you always have positive answers. Because when you multiply two negative numbers, they're exactly the same in a row. The two negatives gives you a positive, and then one times one is still one. So notice here we go back negative one and up one, right? This is why you always get the positive shape. And notice it's very symmetrical too. So same deal. If I come over here to two, and I say, well, two times two or two squared is four, I come up here to four. Same deal going this way. If I go back to negative two and come straight up, then I am still at positive four. So notice as we keep getting further and further away in the positive or the negative direction, this keeps going up the same amount each time. OK, so that's the basic thing we're looking at when we talk about a quadratic. And eventually we'll talk about, I think this will probably be next time, this point here is zero, zero. This is the lowest point. This is like the bottom of the roller coaster, right? Well, of course, you know, the math guys, they got to be all fancy and make themselves feel important. So they give that a special name. And a special name for that guy is called a vertex. OK. But again, like I said, that's probably going to be next times. So. All right. Any questions so far? Wizard? <laughs> okay, what's the wizard mean? I'll get it.
All right, so let's pop Desmos out of here for a minute. We'll bring him back as needed. So we're going to drag Desmos out. Okay, so let's go back to what we were doing. So we said... So we said that y equals x squared. We saw what that graph looked like, right? And now this is 6 times x squared. So the question is, what effect does that have on the graph? So let's think about this in terms of just a linear graph, an x. So if you have y equals x, you just get a nice diagonal graph going across, right? Because when one equals, you know, when one, when one, x equals one, y equals one, x equals two, y equals two, so on and so forth. Okay, but when you stick the six out front, remember in an x graph, the six is the slope. So now the slope is six instead of one. So that means that our line becomes steeper. And kind of the same thing happens here because think of it this way: I got that x squared graph. You saw it, right? But if I stick a six out in front of it, it's going to go up six times faster. So let's see what that does to our graph. All right, so here's our original again. And let's go ahead and we'll do another one here. I'm going to do X and I'm going to get the squared thing. Okay. So now the blue gra graph is right over the red graph because they're the same. So let's stick that X in front of it here. So we want a 6 in front of this. Ooh, look what just happened. So a big positive number in front of the X squared we said it's going to make the graph go up six times faster, so it makes our parabola look skinnier, doesn't it? It's it, it's not as wide, which means because the thing is here, if you're going over one in the original, we can probably move this down a little bit. So in the original, if we went over one, we went up one, right? So we went over one, up one, okay. So in this one, notice that when we went over one, so here, here we went over one, up one. There's that guy. Now if we go over one, we're going up six. Okay. So it's going up faster, which means that your parabola is going to look skinnier or thinner or it goes up faster. That's the thing. Okay, cool. All right, so let's see if we can make some predictions here. So that was 14. Let's look at 15. So this says 0.6 x squared. So 0.6 is between 1 and 0, correct? That's really 6 tenths or 3 fifths. So you can think of it as a fraction, you can think of it as a decimal, doesn't matter. So what do you think is going to happen with a 0.6? How is that going to make this thing look different? So if a number above one makes it skinnier, what do you think the, the 0 0.6 does? Well, it makes Bigger or wider. Good. Good, Chloe. So you're getting the idea of this thing. So let's go ahead and do that. So instead of calling this guy six, so watch the one in blue. We're going to call him 0.6. So you see it got a little wider than the original. So basically, the closer this number is to zero, the wider this thing is going to get between zero and one. Okay. And then as you saw, if the number is bigger than one, then it goes up faster and it gets skinnier. So the same deal here is this one is only going to go up 60% as fast. So in the original, we went over one 
an up one. That's right there. In this one, if we go over one, we're only going up 0.6. So it goes up a little slower. So that's what's going on there. OK. So what we're finding here with these guys is we're talking about different kinds of functions. We've talked a lot about linear functions. Now we're talking about quadratics. But the stuff that happens as far as transformations is the same for any function. They all do the same basic things, OK? So let's look at 16. So 16 says negative 7x squared. So the 7 is bigger than the 6, so that means our graph's going to be even skinnier than the one that was for 6. But what's the minus sign do for us? What's that minus sign going to do? Below, it's going to flip it over. Great, Chloe. Good job. So what this is saying, because remember, you got to follow your order of exponents thing, right? So if we do that, we put some number in here. So let's just say we're going to put in one. OK. So one times one is still one, but then you multiply that by negative seven because we do exponents before multiplication, right? So then this would be one times one is one and then times negative seven. So this thing is going to go down instead of up. So let's take a look at that. All right, so first things first. We change this guy to a seven. So there we see pretty skinny going up, right? And then when we throw the minus out front, now it's going downhill. Or not downhill, but just down, period. And again, the same deal. If we go over one, we're going to go all the way down to minus seven. And remember, these are symmetrical. So if you go back one, negative one times negative one is positive one again, and then times the negative seven. So that's going to be down here again. All right. Questions so far? So it's all based on this guy in the red. Right. It's all based on him. And then we move around from there. Cool. All right, so next one is negative 0.15. So the minus sign means we're still going to be going down, right? What's a 0.15 going to do for us? Is that going to make us skinnier or wider? What's that going to do? Yeah, that'll make us wider again, won't it? Let's take a look at it again. So we're going to leave the negative sign, but instead of having 7, we're going to have 0.15. As you can see, pretty wide. Because again, it takes it longer to start going up. So even if we pick a fairly big number, like say, I don't know, five, right? So we do 5 times 5, that's 5 squared, but then 5 squared times 0.15 is only 0.75. Okay. And that's negative. So that's why it takes a while to get going. All right, so let's move that out of there. All right, so how about this guy? How about 18 there? 
So this is 0 0.04 x squared. So first question is, are we going up or down? So we have positive 0.4, we're going up or down? Yeah, we're going up, perfect. So positive means going up, negative means going down. That makes sense, right? And 0 0.04, that's pretty small, right? That's pretty close to zero. So what's that going to do for our graph? Is it going to be wider? Are you going to be skinnier? What's going to happen? So 0 0.04, what's going to happen here? Yeah, it's going to go up, but it's going to go up real slow. All right, so let's check that out. So this is 0.15, and you see how wide that guy is. So if I get rid of the sign here, now he's going up, right? But it's going to be even wider than that, so let's check it out. So we're going to make this guy instead of 0.15, we're going to make him 0 0.04. Whoa. So he's barely going up. He'll keep going up, but he's barely going up, right? Okay. And then we got one more here. So this one is 4.5x squared. So we're still going up, but what about our graph? He's pretty wide right now. What's going to happen? Yeah, skinny, right? So I'm going to put that on off camera, but you'll be able to see it move here. So there it's just the same, right? But now if we do 4.5, I'm typing that in. Notice how much wider, or I mean how much skinnier it got, right? So again, here's our original guy. And if we do 4.5, he's going up 4.5 faster. So that's our guy. All right, so the moral of the story is this. Let me get something right with that would be awesome. So the moral of the story is the number out front, right? So if he's bigger than one, so we say if he is greater than one, then we get the wide graph, right? So we get something wide like that. Okay. Or no, my bad. That's if he's less than one. Let me fix that. Might be Tuesday, but it feels like Monday. So this is less than one. So this would be like a fraction. So we'll say between zero and one, right? So between zero and one. So zero to one, we're going to get the wide thing, right? So now, greater than one, that's where we get the skinny graph, right? So that's going to be more like this guy. Okay. So that's one thing we need to know. The other thing we need to know is if it's a plus, our graph's going up. And if it's minus, our graph's going down. All right, so that's some pretty basic stuff, but that's that's the idea. So this, this pretty much all sums it up right here. Okay. Questions? Okay, let's go ahead and move on. But if you got those basic things down, that's going to help you a lot with this kind of stuff, especially when they're asking you to recognize graphs. Because say they give you a multiple choice question, they say, well, what does the graph of this look like? And two of the graphs are going up. You know those are wrong. 
one graph's wide and one graph skinny. Yeah, guess what? It's a skinny graph going up. You don't have to do any work. Sweet. All right, let's continue on. OK, so it says over what interval is the function increasing and what interval is it decreasing? So what that means is if we have a graph with an x squared, right? So we go left to right, just like we read. We read left to right, OK? So let's say you're a very small stick figure, stick person running along here and you're going to the right. And also we're going down the hill, right? And I know hills are kind of a foreign concept to Florida people because you don't have any. <laughs> None to speak of anyway. So that means that at that point the function is decreasing and it looks like it's decreasing from here on back, right? And then we get to this bottom point, which once again I mentioned was called a vertex. But that'll probably be for tomorrow's session. OK, and when we hit that vertex, then all of a sudden we start going uphill again, right? Which is a lot harder to pedal on our bikes, right? So then this part over here is decreasing, right? And this part over here is increasing. Cool. Okay, so we look at this thing and we're at minus two, right? And we're at negative 1.2, then we go to minus one and we're at 0.3 and we go to zero and we're at zero, right? So what's happening here? So we're at negative 1.2, then we're at negative 0.3, then we're at zero. So on this part, this thing is even though it's negative numbers, it's going up, right? So this would be the increasing part here. Let's change colors so we don't get confused. You know, it's confusing enough as it is. So this part here is going to be increasing. For this part, right? So probably what this is, this is a graph that looks like this. OK, and zero, zero is where we topped out. OK, and we're coming in from this direction, right? Stick figure again. Coming in from this direction. So all of a sudden, oh, we hit the hill. We're going up, right? So that's increasing. Then notice what happens after this. So we get to the top, then we get to this side, and look, we're going back down again. Here's the point three. Here's the minus 1.2. And notice these numbers are the same because remember we said that these guys are very symmetrical, right? So from zero on back, we're going to be increasing and then from zero forward we'll be decreasing. So this part is the decreasing. Technically this guy in the middle is neither increasing or decreasing. So he's technically neither because you're just sitting here at the top. You're not going up, you're not going down, you're just sitting at the top. OK, so that's what they want to know about when they're saying well, where is it increasing, where is it decreasing, that kind of thing. OK. So it's pretty easy to tell because what we want to go by. Is the second column here or the Y values because the Y values tell, tell you how high or low you are on the graph. OK, does that make sense? All right. So let's move on. OK, so this one says over what interval are we increasing and decreasing? So this guy, we start off at negative 2 and we're at 52. Then we go to negative 1 and we're all the way down to 13. Then we go to 0 and we're at 0. So what's this thing look like? So again, 52 is way up here, then 13, then 0. And we hit this point here, right? Then look what happens. So then we start going back up when we hit one and we hit two. So we go to 13 then we go back to 52. So there's that part. OK. 
So again, same deal. You're coming in from left to right. So as he's running along this way, he's coming down the hill, right? So this will be our decrease, right? And then we go to the other side. And we start going up again, right? So this will be our increase. Okay. And like I say, technically this guy in the middle isn't doing either. He's just sitting right there. So he's either going up or going down. We've just hit the bottom of the thing. All right. So again, you watch what happens with the Y values. And that tells you where you're going. So then this guy is going to increase from zero forward, right? And he's going to decrease from zero back. Now, sometimes the math guys want to get extra fancy with this crap, right? Crap, of course, is a technical term. And they'll write this in something they call interval notation. Kind of a pain in the butt, but here it is. So the interval notation says we're going back this way. We're going to negative infinity. So infinity, they write as an eight on its side for some reason. So that means infinity. And we're going to go all the way up, but we're not going to include the zero. So that's why we use a parenthesis. If we included the zero, we'd use like a square bracket. But zero is not included because at that point, we're neither increasing or decreasing. And then for the other part, the interval where we're increasing, it's like, okay, we're going to start at zero, but we're not including zero. So anything past zero is good. And then we're just going to keep going up and up and up and up all the way to positive infinity. Okay. So if you're running the interval notation, I just want you guys to know what it is. Okay. All right, let's check out a couple more. We'll call it. So it says write a quadratic function to give the area, then find the area given the value. Okay. So with a square, it's just length times width, right? So it's length times width. They're telling us the length is x, the width is x. And to figure out area, you multiply them together, right? So this is just going to be x times x, so this is going to be x squared. Okay, so this one, the area equals x squared. So the longer x gets, the bigger the area gets. Makes sense, right? So in this one, they said, well, what if x is 13? That means just plug in 13 here. So that's going to be 13 squared. 13 times 13 is 169. Take my word for it, I've done it too much. Okay. All right, so the next guy, area of a triangle. So we need to remember some of this stuff back from geometry, right? So area of a triangle equals one half the base times the height. So the base is X. Turns out as well, the height is X, right? And then it's one half then. The reason it's one half is if we had a square, right, it would just be x times x like we had over here. But when you cut it in half, we get two triangles, right? That's why it's one half. We do the same thing over here. If we cut this guy in half, then this triangle here will be the same thing, one half base times the height. Okay, if you ever wonder why it was one half, that's why. A lot of times they don't tell you that. So again, the same thing. So we're going to do one half. And since base time heights are both x, it'll be x times x. So that's going to be x squared. So our area over here is one half x squared. Now we need to plug in 2.5. So 2.5 times 2.5 is 6.25. Cut that in half. That would be 3.125. But most people haven't sat and done math in their head as much as me, so we probably need the calculator. Let's break him out just to make sure I didn't mess that up. Here's our calculator. Uh, there he is. Let's bring him on the scene. 
He was a little big today. Let's uh, try to trim him down a little bit. There we go. That's good. Okay. Move him up a little. Perfect. Okay. So the first one. So we've got. We're going to plug in 2.5 over CX. So it's going to be 2.5 times 2.5. Equals 6.25. And then remember, one half is the same as multiplying by 0.5. So do that. So then this equals 3.125. Cool. All right. So some practical places where you use quadratics. This one says, how do we, how do the average rate of change for each function compare over the given interval? Average rate of change. They love that term. That comes up a lot. Average rate of change. Okay. So that's, that's a code for something else. And here's the code word. They say average rate of change. We are talking about slope anytime you see a problem where it says average rate of change we're talking slope with a sloppy looking p okay all right so it says so how do these compare over the intervals all right we'll probably only have time for maybe one of these guys So let, let's work with 25 because it doesn't have decimals. The decimals are just kind of a pain in the wazoo, right? Okay, so here's what you do. What it is, is this is going to be a couple of graphs that are, you know, they're x squared, so they're going to be u-shaped, but then minus two. So one's going to be going like this, right? And one's going to be going like this. So the one that has the minus two x would be this guy. The one that has the minus four x is this guy. Now, what they're talking about when they say average rate of change is they're picking a couple points on this thing. Let me clean this up a little bit. I'll, I'll just use one of these guys. We don't need all the extra stuff here. One moment, please. All right, so just, we'll work with this guy for a second. All right, so when they say average rate of change over an interval, what they're talking about is they're saying, okay, we want to know what is our value when x equals minus 4? So we get like a number line here, right? We'll say, okay, so here's minus 4. We come up, and he's right there, right? And then it says, okay, we're going to go between there and negative 2. So if I project up, negative 2 is right there. Now, this is a curve. When they say average rate of change, and I said slope, you're like, slope? How am I going to do the slope of a curved line? You're not. You're right. But what you're going to do is you're going to say, well, what if I just drew a straight line from here to here? Okay. So now we have a line. We can figure out the slope of that line. That's why it's the average rate of change, because at some point here, it's going to be changing a little more. It's going to be changing a little less. But this is the average. This is kind of the guy right in the middle. Okay. And like I said, they love these questions on the ACT, the SAT, stuff like that. So here's how we do this. Let's go ahead and work with this guy. We'll start with him. So we're going to plug in minus 4 here where we see the x squared, right? So minus 4 times minus 4 is a positive 16, right? But then we have to take the positive 16 and multiply it by negative 2. So at x equals negative 4, y is going to be negative 32. Okay, so there's point number 1. Point number 2 is we're going to plug in the negative 2 into x squared. 
Okay, so that's negative two times negative two, so that's gonna be positive four, right? But then the positive four also gets multiplied by the negative two. So positive four times negative two is negative eight. So what we're saying at this point is when we're at minus two, we are going to be at negative eight. Okay, so the average rate of change is the slope. Now I have my own method for doing slope. Hopefully you like it, and if you don't, we have other ways to do it. But I kind of do this, so I say, all right, start with the second terms, because that's the y's, right? Because it's always x, y, x, y, right? So our y value goes from negative 32 all the way up to negative 8. And working with negative numbers is a little harder for you guys because we actually have negative temperatures in Ohio. So when we say the temperature is negative 2 degrees and it drops 3 degrees, it's now negative 5 degrees, right? But if it's negative 5 and it goes all the way up to negative 2, we went up 3 degrees. But like I said, you guys are like, huh, what? It doesn't get below 50. What are you talking about? So anyway, so if you go from negative 32 all the way up to negative 8, that's going to be positive 24. Okay, then we do the same thing here. If I go from negative four up to negative two, that's going to be positive two. So our slope is 24 divided by two, which is 12. So our average rate of change for this guy is 12. Okay. Then we do the same thing with the other guy. We only got a couple minutes, so I'm going to do this real quick. So in this one, I'm going to plug in minus 4 here, I'm going to get 16 positive, but then I get negative 4 times 16, that's going to be minus 64. So this guy is going to be when x equals minus 4, y equals negative 64. Okay, then we're going to plug in the 2, negative 2, excuse me. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, but then positive 4 times a negative 4 is a negative 16. So at negative 2, and we'll do this We'll do this at the beginning of the next class, so don't worry if you're not catching it just yet. Okay, so that's going to be a negative 16. So then we do the same thing. So we start with the y's. I went from 64, negative 64, all the way up to negative 16, right? So that's going to be up 48. So if you're in Alaska and it was minus 64 degrees and it does get that cold there, my wife has family there, they're, they're insane. I don't know why anybody would live there. <laughs> the temperature actually went up 48 degrees and it's still negative 16. Ooh. And then same thing over here. We do minus 4 up to minus 2. I went up 2. So then this guy, 48 divided by 2 is 24. So the average rate of change on the first guy was 12. The average rate of change on this guy was 24. And notice that this guy, the coefficient is twice as big as this guy. So our average rate of change was twice as big for this guy as this guy. Whoa. <laughs> so again, like I said, we'll go over, I'll probably redo this problem next time. I just wanted to kind of Get it in front of you, and then uh, next time we'll uh, we'll go through these again a little bit slower. But I just wanted to cram one in here before we head it out. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I've already got attendance, so we're good to go there. So I'm going to shut down the recording. Well, thank you for stopping by. Hopefully, we'll see you all tomorrow.